Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to take a look at the AYN Loki Zero. This finally arrived. This is a device that I pre-ordered about a year ago at this point, but they are finally shipping. Now the reason why I'm so excited about this handheld PC is that it's the first one that I can actually call a budget-based handheld. The starting price is $250 before shipping, making this the cheapest handheld PC that you can buy new right now. In addition, this has the same excellent hardware and controls that we found in the original AYN Loki Max, which is at a much higher price point. Really, the only difference between them is going to be the chipset and the performance that you can expect. So this is why I think the Loki Zero has the potential of being a game changer. It's actually the cheapest handheld PC that you can get right now, but it also has some really excellent hardware and comes in at a much smaller size than the Steam Deck. Anyway, we have a ton of ground to cover here in this video and it's probably gonna be a long one. So grab your favorite drink and a snack and let's jump right in. Okay, to start, you might be wondering what is the AYN Loki Zero? And like I mentioned, this is a handheld PC that is meant to fill that budget space. It was first announced last summer, but they are now finally starting to ship those pre-orders. And I ordered mine on that very first day of pre-ordering, so I have one of those first shipments. Now let's talk a bit about the specs. The CPU is an AMD Athlon Silver 3050E. This is an older laptop processor with two cores and four threads and a base clock speed of 1.4 gigahertz. And it's using onboard Radio on Vega 3 graphics. Now the RAM here is interesting. They have four gigabytes that are already on board, but it also has a SODIMM slot. So if you wanted to add your own RAM or upgrade it, as I'll talk about here in a second, it comes with 64 gigabytes of storage, but then also a micro SD card slot. And it has a six inch LCD IPS display. Now the specs here say that it's a 720p panel, but the one that I received is 1080p. And I'm not sure if that's just because it's one of the very first shipments or if they all are gonna be 1080p going forward. For wireless connectivity, we have Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 4.2, and it has a single USB-C port that is rated for USB 3.2 and DisplayPort out. That means you'll be able to hook it up to an external display, but it will not work with an external GPU. Another thing of note is that the battery is 46.2 watt hours. That's about 15% larger than on the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally. And we'll do a full battery test here near the end of the video. Now the starting price on the Loki Zero is $249, but do bear in mind that doesn't include shipping and any applicable taxes depending on where you live. And also when checking out, there are a couple of upgrade options. For example, you can expand the storage to 128 gigs, but honestly, I'm not sure if that one's going to be worth it just because you have a micro SD card slot inside and that's not a huge jump in storage anyway. However, for an additional $13, you can double the RAM from four to eight. And I think that is going to be a big deal in terms of price to performance. And I personally did choose this upgrade. So this device that I'm testing today will have that full eight gigabytes of RAM. So let's go ahead and do a quick unboxing. This is very similar to other Loki devices, so I don't want to spend too much time on this right here. And really, there's not much to talk about here inside. We've got the device, a quick instruction manual, and that's really about it. And taking a look at the Loki Zero, this is the exact same hardware as the Loki Max, which I've previously reviewed. And honestly, that's a good thing. One of the best things about the Loki Max was its exceptionally made hardware. So I don't want to spend a ton of time going over the look and the feel of this device just because I went into it in detail in the two Loki Max videos that I made. So if you want to get a really good grasp of how this device is going to feel in the hands, I would recommend checking out those two videos, which I'll leave linked down below. Suffice to say, from a hardware perspective, there are a lot of great things with the Loki models. You can definitely tell that the design team spent a lot of time getting everything just right, and it's kind of reflective in how long it's been taking to actually come to market. And I do briefly want to go over the controls here just to give you an idea of what's good and what's not so good about them. And I think we should start with the good stuff first. Number one is going to be these analog sticks. These are full-size analog sticks, very similar to what you would find on a console controller. Now these do not have magnetic hull sensors like some of the more modern controllers, but all the same, they have a nice smooth glide to them and just feel really good. They're also quite tall, which means the device is not going to be super pocketable, but all the same, it gives you very nice granular controls. I really like the D-pad too. This has a soft dome switch connection, which means it's going to be a little bit clicky, but very soft to the touch. It has a tactile response, which to me feels very precise, but they also loosened it up a bit. And so because of that, it also feels kind of old school as well. To put that into context, when playing something like a Street Fighter game, I feel like I can do all the moves no problem. So in addition to like platformers working well, these rolling motions feel good too. This is definitely Hadoukenable and Shoryukenable. In fact, this is one of my favorite D-pads on handheld PCs right now. 
And same goes with the face buttons. These have a rubber membrane connection, but are also very kind of shallow and tactile. And what this means is the buttons are very easy to press down on, but are also responsive. They're kind of the best of both worlds. I also like the fact that they have a somewhat flat shape to them while being rounded on the edges. They're just really comfortable to use and I could press down on them all day. Again, these are some of my favorite face buttons on a handheld PC right now. And it's kind of amazing that we're getting such good controls on a device that costs way less than the competition. And in addition to the controls, I think that the grips are a nice complement as well. They're nice and prominent, but they're also rounded in a way that fits pretty well with your hands. Now, bearing in mind this is a relatively small handheld PC, there's not quite enough room for your entire hand. For me personally, I found that my pinkies just kind of dangle from the bottom here. It's not super uncomfortable, but it's not like a full-size grip like on the Steam Deck. The last thing I like about the controls are the shoulders and triggers. These shoulders are easy to press down on, and you can actuate the button from basically any position. I also think that these hall sensor analog triggers have a very nice smooth feel to them. However, this is also the start of some of those nitpicks I have about the overall hardware. To start, these triggers are quite loud when you press down on them all together. They kind of have a clacky sound to them. Let me give you a listen. Additionally, I don't really like the texture of the plastic. I found that it gets really smudgy. Even after a couple minutes of use, you'll start to see your fingerprints here on the back. Now there are some white Loki models available, but unfortunately not for the Loki Zero. That one only comes in black. This one right here is my white Loki Max that I had pre-ordered last year that finally arrived a few weeks back. And personally, I think the white version looks a lot cleaner than the black one, even if it does have more prominent bezels. Now the Loki Zero does have two back paddles, but these are programmed for only L3 and R3, and you can't change them in the software. So that's another bummer for me. And really that's about it when it comes to my hardware gripes. Let's go over the rest of the IO. On the front, we have our select and start button and then two menu buttons here on the bottom. And it also has front firing stereo speakers. Taking a look up top, we have our exhaust vent here on the left, then our volume up and down, our power indicator, and then our power and sleep button. On the bottom, we have a micro SD card slot and I put a one terabyte card in mine and I played all my games off the card, which you'll see in my testing here. We also have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, that USB-C port, and then a microphone hole as well. Also on the back, you can see we have our fan intake, and then along the sides, we have some RGB lighting strips, and we do have RGB lighting around the analog sticks as well. Doing a quick teardown, here is the cooling system. Now this is basically covering everything that you would need to get to if you wanted to do an upgrade. So for example, the internal storage or the RAM, all that's gonna be kind of a pain to get to. Everything else is pretty easy to replace, like the analog sticks or the controls, all of those are pretty accessible. But I would say that word to the wise, if you are going to try to upgrade the RAM or the SSD, it might be a pain in the butt. Next, we're going to do an audio test at max volume. And I think the audio quality here is good, but it is quieter than I was expecting it to be. So it may not be the best for loud environments, but I think just for everyday use, it'll be fine. Now, in terms of comparison with other devices, there are only two that I'm gonna show off. The first one here is the Ambernic Win 600. And this one came out last year and has the exact same chip as the Loki Zero, the AMD Athlon 3050E. I did a bunch of videos on this device last year and I felt like it had a lot of deal-breaking hardware issues. For example, it had really small analog sticks that were poorly placed. It was very very hard ergonomic wise to actually use the analog sticks and the triggers at the same time. And I felt like that ruined the experience that you could have with many games that would play on this chip. And besides the poor ergonomics, I felt like there were quite a few other hardware flaws. For example, this only had single channel RAM and also digital triggers, which made it kind of hard to use with modern games. And from a hardware perspective, I think that the Loki Zero is way better than the Win 600 in every single regard. Also bear in mind that this Ambernic handheld PC is $100 more than the Loki Zero. And there was a tiny sliver of time where the Win 600 made a little bit of sense to actually pick up. It was smaller than the Steam Deck and about the same price. Now I think the only other handheld PC we can compare it against is the Steam Deck because this is the next cheapest device. And as you can see here, there's a huge size difference between these two. Now, as we'll see later in this video, when it comes to price to performance, I think the Steam Deck still wins hands down. However, as you can see, the size difference between the two is night and day. So if that is something that's very important to you, that might make a lot more sense. In terms of weight, this is one pound and four ounces or about 569 grams, which is a full 100 grams lighter than the Steam Deck. 
And I think this is an excellent overall everyday size. It's something that you can play on the couch or take in the car or even on an airplane, absolutely no problem. You can definitely find smaller handheld PCs and other emulator devices on the market, but I do think this is an excellent combination of both the size and weight and ergonomics. Now this is a Windows based handheld, but I do want to also go over the Loki Control Center, which is their software suite. And within here you can do things like adjust the CPU and GPU load, and you can also adjust your TDP or overall power load. In addition, you can adjust your frames per second limiter and then also the fan curve. And on the bottom left, they have a variety of frame rates that you can set at various refresh rates. We have 60, 50, and 40 hertz options here. Now on the bottom right, you can adjust the RGB lighting. They have two settings here. There's an auto setting, which will just basically cycle through the colors. And then also a manual setting where you can set just one single color and then also the overall brightness. So what I've been doing is just using blue at about 10%. That seems to work well. Now if you tap on that cog button, it will bring up some other options like adjusting the volume and screen brightness, as well as the opacity of the Loki control center itself. When it comes to screen quality, I found that this display is pretty bright. In fact, in all my footage, I'm doing at the lowest brightness setting. So it does look like they really did favor a brighter tone over something that you'd be able to play in the dark. Now the Loki also comes with a few hotkeys. Let me show you those real quick. If we hold on to the start button for a few seconds, it'll bring up an on-screen keyboard. And if you hold on to the select button, it'll show the desktop. Now we're already seeing the desktop, so it's not really working, but that's how you would do it. If you press select and start at the same time, it's gonna bring up a task manager, and that'll be handy if you need to force quit an application. Additionally, if you hold on to L1 and R1 for a few seconds, it'll switch over to mouse and keyboard mode. This will make the left analog stick behave as a mouse cursor, and then you can use the A and B buttons as your left and right mouse clicks. And to go back to the controller mode, you would just hold on to L1 and R1 again. Now in terms of navigation and software experience, I generally just use Steam Big Picture mode and that's what I did here. And so this will be great if the majority of your titles are already within the Steam library like with me. Now I also used EmuDeck for Windows to set up all my emulation stuff here in Steam. And so that's why it's integrated within the non-Steam tab. And finally, before we get started, let me show you the on-screen display that I set up for this device in particular. Up top we have our overall GPU load shown as a percentage, and then also our GPU temperatures. You can see how hot everything's going to get. In Inside. Along those same lines, we have our overall CPU load and then also our RAM usage. So this can be anywhere up to 8 gigabytes, which I have as my total here on this device. Next, we have our graphical backend and then our frames per second. And below that, we have our battery power. So I have 95% battery remaining with 43 watt hours. I also have an estimated time remaining before the battery gets depleted. And then finally, in white, we have our TDP and then in yellow, we have our total package power. So the negative number here is exactly how many watts are being drained at that time. And if there's ever a time where I have the device plugged in, you'll see it's a positive note because it's charging. So now let's go ahead and get into our PC game testing. We're gonna start with our lightweight games and try to work our way up as much as we can. Now for the very lightweight games, you'll get somewhere between six to eight watts in the TDP. And at the very end of this section, I'll talk about how much battery life you can expect at these various wattages. When it comes down to it, I think this is where the device really shines. It's somewhere between 6 and 8 watts, playing very lightweight PC games. And with this kind of setup, I think that the one direct competitor is not any other handheld PC, but the Nintendo Switch. After all, many of these lightweight PC games have been ported over to the Switch and you can buy them online. However, if there are specific games that you can only find on the Steam Store that are not available on the Switch, this one starts to make more and more sense. A good example is going to be Stardew Valley. This is a game you can play on a bunch of different systems, but on the PC in particular, there are a bunch of different mods that you can use. And so this being a handheld PC would be able to take advantage of all those different mod opportunities. Now, as we start going beyond that very low tier of eight watts and below, we are going to be able to start playing a little bit more heavyweight games. In general, I would still expect to play mostly 2D games or maybe some really old 3D games. Something like Morrowind will play just fine. Even more recent games like Sea of Stars actually only requires about a 10 watt TDP. So I think you'd have a great time playing this game on the Loki Zero. So long story short, if you primarily focus on these more lightweight or indie PC games, then I think the Loki Zero might be a really good fit. Especially if you feel like the Steam Deck is a little bit larger than you need. However, one thing to bear in mind is that when you start using 3D graphics with this processor, things just kind of start to fall apart. For example, this game here called Alba A Wildlife Adventure is a very lightweight 3D game. All the same, when trying to play this at 1080p on default settings, it basically will max out the 20 watt TDP. Other more recent games like Whisker Squadron Survivor and Cult of the Lamb are more GPU dependent. And so you can see right here in this game, even with a 40 hertz cap, 
my GPU is maxing out at about 98, 99%. And unfortunately, I'm not getting a very consistent frame rate with these either. So when it comes to PC games, there is definitely a limit to what this chipset can handle. However, if you don't mind messing around with settings, you can get some pretty good performance with certain games. For example, with Fallout New Vegas here at 720p medium settings, I'm getting a pretty consistent 60 frames per second. However, bear in mind this will require about 15 watt average TDP, which is going to drain the battery in about two hours. Now, if you want to extend that battery life, what you can do is then change the refresh rate on this panel down to 40 hertz. The game's still going to play nice and smooth here at 720p, but now it only requires a 10 watt TDP. So in this setup, we've basically shaved off about a third of the overall power requirement while still getting a very nice gameplay experience. Another good example is Portal 2. At 1080p and default settings, it's just kind of all over the place when it comes to frames per second, around 35 altogether. Now, if we drop it down to 720p and then also use that 40 hertz refresh rate, we're now getting that locked in 40 frames per second, but then also the TDP is dropped down to about an average of 10. So there's definitely some things you can do to give you a more consistent frame rate or to extend your battery life. Just bear in mind that that's going to be your upper limit. You're not going to be able to play a lot of really 3D heavy games without making a lot of compromise. All right, next we're going to move over to emulation. I have some pretty interesting observations here. And we're just going to start here with 16-bit systems just because we know the things that are going to be lighter weight than this are going to play just fine. And I found that the average for these 16-bit based games is between 9 and 10 watts on average. And as expected, all of these games play absolutely fine at full speed. Moving over to Nintendo 64, this one I upscaled to a 720p resolution, and I was able to play every single game at a full speed. The overall wattage would vary somewhere between 11 and 12 watts altogether. Either way, I'm very comfortable in saying here that yes, Nintendo 64 is going to play fine, even upscaled to 720p. Up next, we have Sega Dreamcast. This one I also upscaled to 720p, and like with the Nintendo 64, absolutely no problems here playing everything at full speed. It did have a higher power demand. I would say the average is between 13 and 14 watts altogether. But all the same, yes, every game is definitely playable. Now, unfortunately, that's not going to be the same case with every single system. For example, Sega Saturn did not play at full speed. And this game here, Nights into Dreams, is not the most intensive of games to emulate in the first place. I think this is just where that dual core CPU is really hitting a bottleneck. I had a similar experience with Sony PSP. Many games would play at a 3x resolution, which is basically 720p. However, one of the harder games to play, God of War Chains of Olympus, did not run at full speed even at a 2x resolution. In fact, I had to drop this one down to the native resolution just to be able to get a more consistent 60 frames per second. And unfortunately, playing PSP games at their native resolution on a 6-inch display like this does not look very good. It looks really blocky and chunky. Now, as we move on to the other emulated systems, I want to show off the Passmark scores here for this chip. Because this will definitely come into play in regards to emulation. For example, the team behind the PS2 emulator recommends a single thread rating of 2000 on a CPU in order to be able to play their emulator. And you can see that the rating for this chipset is well under 2000. In fact, it's under 1500. So that means the Loki Zero is going to reach an emulation limit within generation 6. So let's go ahead and move on to our first gen 6 system, which is the PlayStation 2. And like I mentioned, the performance here is pretty inconsistent and it was hard to guess which games would play well and which wouldn't. There were definitely some games that would play at a 2x resolution, including Grand Theft Auto 3 playing absolutely fine right here. For other games, even those that are more heavyweight played at a full speed but at native resolution. I personally was not expecting to be able to play Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, or Metal Gear Solid 2, but they all ran just fine. But the weird thing is that other games that I considered to be more lightweight had problems. And it was kind of expected with some games like Burnout Revenge, this is a medium weight game altogether. But other games that I would consider to be somewhat lightweight, you know, something like Soul Calibur 2 or NBA Street 2, these ones would not play at full speed at a native resolution. So to get these games to play at full speed, you'll probably have to do quite a bit of configuration and hacks to get these to run. And like I said, it was really inconsistent. For example, God of War 2 here at a native resolution played just fine. I actually got a pretty consistent 60 frames per second here. So it's kind of unfortunate, but I'm hesitant to say that the Loki Zero is going to play at full speed with PlayStation 2. There were just enough games that didn't play really well to give me pause. And it was a similar experience with Nintendo GameCube. There were definitely games that played at full speed, even some that played at a 2x resolution. If I had to guess based on my testing with GameCube, I would say maybe 50% of games are going to play absolutely no problem, and many of those will play at a 2x resolution. However, as you start moving up, you'll get some slowdowns here and there. For example, Metroid Prime, even at a native resolution, would still get slowdowns as I was playing through. 
And the more heavyweight games like F-Zero GX did not play at full speed, even at a native resolution. So much like with PS2, I'm not comfortable in saying that this is going to play every GameCube game absolutely fine. And along those same lines, Nintendo Wii also had a few issues here and there. The more lightweight games like New Super Mario Bros. and even Resident Evil 4 actually played at full speed no problem, and I was even able to get Super Smash Bros. Brawl to work at a full speed as well. However, there were quite a few games that bogged down. Donkey Kong Country Returns as well as Sonic Colors just really didn't play well. So I think in general, when it comes to PS2, GameCube, and Wii, it's a bit of a crapshoot. It's not going to be very consistent which games will play at full speed and which won't. Now, just to be thorough, I also wanted to test a couple other systems. We'll start with Nintendo Wii U. And I found there were quite a few games that would play at a relatively comfortable speed. These were mostly the more lightweight Wii U games, and they also required a lot of wattage. So most of these games played at about 18 or 19 watt TDP. And it mostly worked well with 2D based titles. When you start moving into things with a more open 3D world, it really starts to bog down. For example, here, even in the beginning stages of Wind Waker HD, it's definitely not getting full speed. I wouldn't consider this game to be playable. A couple other systems that I tried that I think are definitely not worth it are going to be Nintendo Switch, for example here with Super Mario 3D World, which is a more lightweight game to play, it's playing at about half speed. And this is after doing all the tweaks that I could to boost performance, so this is definitely not capable of playing Nintendo Switch. And same thing with PlayStation 3, Afterburner Climax is one of the easiest games to run altogether, but even then this is bogging down at about half speed as well. This emulator in particular requires a lot of cores and threads, and I think having two cores and four threads just isn't enough. So in general that's what I would expect when it comes to Windows based emulation but this device can also boot into Linux so let's test that out next. To start I was able to boot the Jealous firmware directly from an SD card. They have an x86 build and it seems to work really well here. The problem here is that this screen is rotated and there are no screen rotation controls within the Jealous firmware. So unfortunately unless this team builds a fix for this panel this isn't going to be playable. It's a similar story with Botticera, which is a custom Linux-based firmware focused on retro gaming. This one also has that rotated screen, but within the settings they have the ability to rotate it however you'd like. And this actually comes from the fact that the panel that they're using on the Loki Zero is a portrait-based panel. Either way, after making that settings change, Botticera works just fine. The only problem here is that I wasn't able to get it to boot from an SD card. I had to boot it from a flash drive. And you'll have to use a USB-C dongle at the same time, and it just kind of looks a little bit ugly. Additionally, Botticera doesn't support all the configurations, like RGB lighting, or CPU fan speed, or even TDP. And it's a shame because TDP is something that you can adjust in Jealous. It's one of the things I think that would make it really good. Either way, it is nice to be able to have Botticera working on this device, even if it is from a flash drive. This will be nice if you want to have a self-contained emulation system so that you have everything on that one flash drive, including the games and the emulators. That way, with your SD card, you can just focus on having all of your PC games. Now, I also did some performance testing here in Linux, and I was surprised to find that some of these actually performed a lot better. For example, Sega Saturn played at full speed, absolutely no problem here with the Yabasan Shiro core. So yeah, Nights into Dreams here works just fine, but then even the more heavyweight games like Sega Rally Championship, absolutely no problem playing at full speed. Same thing with PlayStation Portable, this played a lot better too. We got a 3x resolution on God of War Chains of Olympus, so it looks great, plays great, everything's good. I also saw a slight improvement in GameCube performance. For example, F-Zero GX is now playing at full speed with a little bit of stutter here and there. And Nintendo Wii also was greatly improved. Here is Sonic Colors playing at almost full speed. There's still a stutter here and there, but I would consider this to be playable. On top of that, another system that plays well in Linux is Nintendo 3DS. This one I had to play at a native resolution, but even then, these games were still playable, including Mario Kart 7 and Super Mario 3D Land. I got a hiccup every once in a while, but I would consider this to be playable. Now, it's not 100% perfect. For example, PlayStation 2 performance seemed to be just about the same, if not a little bit worse here in Linux than it was on Windows. And when it came to Wii U, I definitely saw a huge dip in performance. Look at Wind Waker HD, it's kind of playing like a slideshow. Unfortunately, I can't show you the frames per second within this emulator here in Botticera, but all the same, you can see that this is definitely not playable. All right, and so in wrapping up my game testing, let's talk a little bit about battery life. To start, it took about an hour and 45 minutes to charge it from 0 to 1%, and when I put it into sleep, I lost about 3% overnight. And also considering the fact that this is an x86 based handheld, which means that battery life is just going to suck, it's actually not so bad here on this device. 
If you look at the far right here, our best case scenario, with an average of about 7 watt TDP, I found that games like Blasphemous played for almost 4 hours. And like I mentioned before, this is kind of the sweet spot between 6 and 8 watts, so it's pretty neat that you can be able to play all these games at around 3 to 4 hours altogether. Moving up from there to a 10 watt TDP, I found that even more recently released games like Sea of Stars gave me about 3 hours. And on average when it came to GameCube emulation, it was about 12 watts, which gave me a little bit over 2 hours altogether. Pushing it further to the more intensive 2D games like Hollow Knight, it required a 15 watt TDP, which still gave me about 2 hours of battery life. And then finally, in a worst case scenario where I'm trying to push the TDP as far as possible, Risk of Rain was about 18 watts, and I got an hour and a half of battery life. So on average, I would expect between 2 and 4 hours of battery life depending on how demanding that game is when it comes to that power profile. It's not the best in the world, but I still think that's going to be pretty good for a portable PC. Okay, this video has been going on quite a while, so let's go ahead and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Loki Zero. As always, we'll start with what I like, and number one are the controls. And this has got to be one of the best things about the Loki Zero. They have the same controls as the much more expensive Loki Max at 700 bucks, But for $250, we're still getting that really great control and ergonomic experience. I also like its overall size. It's quite a bit smaller than the Steam Deck and feels much more portable. The device really shines when it comes to light PC gaming, so if you wanted to play light platformers or indie games or maybe visual novels, those are all going to work great right here. I also really enjoyed the audio quality. It could be a little bit louder, but overall it sounds nice and clear. I also like the fact that it boots into Linux because it really expands our ability to use certain emulators, and I think that over time it may come to pass that Linux-based emulation will be really good on this handheld. And finally, I'm just really excited about that $250 entry price. Now, nobody's going to pay only $250 for this device because I do recommend upgrading the RAM, and then you'll also have to pay shipping and any applicable taxes. But as it stands, this is the only $250 Windows-based handheld that's available right now. Now, of course, it's not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about the Loki Zero. Number one is the smudgy plastic. This is the same problem I've had with the Loki Max, and I do wish that they had a white model to be able to hide those smudges a little bit better. I also found that the emulation performance here was very inconsistent. And unfortunately, it does start to cap out in some of those GameCube and PS2 games, so I don't think that the full catalog is going to be playable unless you want to do some heavy tweaks. When it comes down to it, in the PC world, this chip is about three years old at this point, so it feels kind of ancient. And when you start to compare it against all the other handheld PCs in the market, which are admittedly much more expensive, this one does feel really old. If anything, it makes me optimistic for a couple years down the road when some of those really nice chipsets become cheaper. And finally, the other thing about the Loki Zero that I'm not really sure about is the delivery timetable. Yes, they are now shipping out Loki Zeros, but I don't know how large that backlog is, and I don't know how long it would take if you ordered one right now. If I had to guess, I would say that you're probably going to wait maybe a month or two before you actually see it if you were to order it today. So in the end, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend the AYN Loki Zero, and it's really going to come down to you. If you're in the market for a smaller handheld compared to the Steam Deck, but something that can play lightweight PC games, then this is going to be a great fit. And it also works fairly well as an emulation machine, but not quite as good as I was hoping it would be at this price point. So I think if you're well informed and knowing exactly what to expect from the Loki Zero, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck right here. For $250, we're getting a device that punches way above its price point when it comes to controls, screen, as well as battery. The only thing really holding this device back is the power of that CPU inside. So here's the way I see it. If you're good with the amount of performance you saw in this video, then yes, I think that the Loki Zero is well going to be worth that $250 starting price. However, if you are looking for just a little bit better performance, then I would recommend the Loki Mini Pro. This one has a much more powerful and recent CPU that basically will give you double the performance for about $100 more. For example, this one should be able to play PlayStation 2 and GameCube absolutely no problem, even upscaled. And to top it off, it comes in white, which I would prefer over the Loki Zero as well. However, I also have this one pre-ordered and I have no idea when it's going to ship, and so all of those other same issues that we've been dealing with the past year also come to light here with the Loki Mini Pro. In the end, yes, I think that AYN did exactly what the Loki Zero was set out to do, and that is, this is an entry-level handheld PC that can really play entry-level games. And I think there are a lot of people out there who are looking for something just like this, and this is going to be a good fit. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is the Loki Zero on your radar, or are you going to wait for something else? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.